such a lot Till I pissed a tequila and a corner The full length of the parking lot Oh, I talk too loose Again, I talk too open and free I pay a high price for my open talking Like you do for your silent mystery Come and talk to me Please talk to me Talk to me, talk to me Mr. Probably one of my two favorite Joni Mitchell songs, and but it's also the song we should open this show with today because that's what we're going to kind of do is get people to talk. Uh, what we've done, I should back up and say this this episode is like two years in the making. Two years ago, uh, in the mail, David Yaffe's uh, book, um, Reckless Daughter, A Portrait of Joni Mitchell came, and I just turned to whoever would listen to me, which is probably nobody, but I said, look, no, we have to do a Joni Mitchell song, a uh, show, we have to do a whole show about Joni Mitchell. Uh, and it just, I don't know, <laughs> two years went by and that didn't happen. But then a hero came along, Jay Holt, who has never produced an episode of our show, but he, uh, a lot of people are stepping forward uh, to help out as uh, one of our producers, Jonathan McNichols, on paternity leave. And Jay Holt said, I can do that show. I want to do that show. So now we're going to do that show. So what's going to happen as we go along here is you're going to hear some people, some of them are people you know pretty well if you listen to the show a lot. But they've each picked a Joni Mitchell song. They're going to talk about uh, the Joni Mitchell song. Uh, and uh, all the way through, David Yaffe, the aforementioned David Yaffe, and I uh, are going to talk about it. David Yaffe, assistant professor uh, of humanities at Syracuse University uh, and the author most recently of Reckless Daughter, a portrait of Joni Mitchell. Uh, he's with us now. This is actually a song that is uh, important I mean, I guess you could sort of say all Joni Mitchell songs are essentially uh, important to you, but it's it's actually actually one that you've focused on a bit too, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, of course. And and um, there's so many things going on there. I mean, um, musically, one of the part of the joke is that Jaco Pastorius's bass is really talking all the way through the yes. song. <laughs> Yes, I mean, in that she wanted something contrapuntal, and she'd been looking for it from bass players ever since she started recording, and she was always frustrated. And uh, she, when she first heard Jocko, she thought that she dreamed him up. She couldn't believe it. Um, she was on a road trip um, in 1976, and that trip would be the place where she wrote most of the songs for Hegira. And um, she stopped by Robin Ford's place in um, in Colorado in Boulder. And uh, Robin Ford had been he he he'd played on the Miles of Isles tour mm-hmm. when he was quite young, and then he also played on Hissing of Summer Lawns. And then he played on the Hissing of Summer Lawns tour that got cut short after a couple of months. And so this was about a month after that happened. And she said, "Hey, I'm coming to Boulder," uh, and he was like, "Great!" And so she came over. And uh, he had just picked up this album, Jaco Pastorius. Uh, it was a debut album. came out on Columbia Records. It was produced by Herbie Hancock. And yet the, the, uh, the cultural share was so different in 1976. You could have this major album on a major label produced by Herbie Hancock with other famous musicians on it and still not have heard of it, mm-hmm. you know, until someone shares it with someone. And she heard Portrait of Tracy, and she thought, oh, my God, I've got to dig this guy up. And at the time, he was playing bass with um, Phyllis Diller in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> and she dug him up, and she brought him to the studio, and he played on four tracks. The uh, Yeah, he's and, and really, I mean, obviously this guy had something of a tragic arc, but he really is oh, yeah. uh, uh, unlike... You know, any there's no bass player who plays anything like him. So it's this, no. this marriage is a pretty amazing one. Now, one thing that I I loved this song from the moment I heard it, um, yeah, me and, too. I ha- and I have this feeling that I didn't hear it. On. Is it possible that there was a version of Miles of Isles that had this as a bonus tracker? I feel like I heard a live version of it before I ever heard. You might have heard it on a bootleg, okay? Because there were bootleg recordings from that Hissing of Summer Lawns tour, and okay. that that song. Was played on that tour. Well, and well I yeah. Heard, and I, I, wherever I heard it, it blew my mind. Yeah. But and I've sort of gone through life just really loving it and thinking that it's just a, a great, great song about a woman who can't get this mysterious, enigmatic 
annoying uh-huh. guy to talk. Now, uh, I didn't know it was about Bob Dylan. <laughs> so tell us well, about that. Well, yeah. she, she, she told me that and then took it back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is in the spirit of the song, right. actually. Yeah. So she said that she told me that to test me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that we maybe that's a good entree to just the difficult, <laughs> the difficulty of being Joni Mitchell's biographer, or the, yeah. it, it begins as the as the difficulty of being someone writing a magazine article about Joni Mitchell. You and I were chatting about this before we went on mm-hmm. the air, but her first reaction to you writing about her was she never wanted to talk to you again. Eventually, that was true. Yeah. I mean, we we talked for about you know a year until she was done with me, and then I then I talked to everybody else, mm-hmm. and then I got back in there. And she wanted to respond. She's very competitive. Mm-hmm. So she wanted to respond to everybody and what they <laughs> said because she wanted to one-up everybody's story because she prided herself on having a better memory than everybody else. And so she, you know, even though she didn't have such a great memory for names, she called me Jaffe. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, anyway, so that, 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 so she basically coughed up everything i needed for the book right and then she and then she had an aneurysm yeah um yeah i mean i I was going to get to this a little bit later i mean in between the time your book came out and now Mm -hmm. first of all she turned 75 there was that fabulous Mm -hmm. uh concert birthday concert Mm -hmm. for her uh in la uh Mm -hmm. but this whole time she's been dealing with health issues uh including this thing morgellon which people are not even really sure exists right that's right. It's not recognized by, by the AMA, but it's recognized by a community of people who share symptoms. Yeah. And so and it's a thing what it, you feel like you have parasites under your yes. skin or something, yeah. That's right. They 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 experience itchiness, extreme itchiness, and then the things that sh- spring up on their skin after they've scratched and scratched look like they came from another planet. Yeah. So she um, she's her she's seventy five. It seems like in general her, her health's not good. We're we're never gonna have another new Joni Mitchell album, I assume. Probably not. Although I guess you never know because her recovery is certainly way beyond what anybody could have expected. It's amazing that she's even alive. Yeah. And um, so she could keep on. I mean, she's still in a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. Um, although I think she can get along without one, but it's just for trip hazards yeah. that she's in a wheelchair. I mean, I guess um, if we want another Joni Mitchell album, we just have to all keep claiming there won't be one, and then she'll, that's right. she'll get mad. Um, I mean, it's it's not out of the question. I mean, I, I doubt it, mm-hmm. but it's not out of the question because everything she did was implausible. From the very beginning, yeah. it was implausible. And no, the, the doctors told her that she wouldn't walk after she had polio. Mm-hmm. Um, um, which is, yeah, so that's... It, it, yeah, it was just one implausible thing after the next. We should say she had you know? childhood polio, and yeah, um, and it, it, it is actually one of the reasons, I guess, that she does these kind of peculiar tool- tunings, right? Oh, because it's of, the no, yeah. it's the entire reason why. It's yeah. the entire reason why, you know, because she she uh, has a weak left hand and a strong right hand. Yeah, um, and for some reason, you know, you think about like Paul McCartney as a lefty, he just turned mm-hmm. the thing upside down, right? But her way was these open tunings. I mean, uh, Eric Anderson uh, showed her the open G, and she just went on from there. But what's very unusual about it is that even though she's not the first pop musician to use open tunings, nobody has been as elaborate with the open tunings as Joni. Uh, like Keith Richards, for example. You know, Don Everly showed Keith Richards the open G, mm. and then he, he wrote all of the great riffs for the Stones in that open G. And uh, but that's all he learned was the one. Right. She doesn't. He doesn't have like thirty-seven open tunings. No, she has like more than sixty of them. So I mean, there's nobody's done that. I mean, there's a guy named Michael Hedges, maybe who has that many. Mm. But but. Oh yeah, I know who he is. So so David Yaffe uh, or Jaffe, as the case may be, uh, Ah. we prefer Yaffe. Uh, David Yaffe, one of the things we thought would be fun for you, maybe a little bit different from some of the interviews you've done, is just like you know, you've done this incredible, uh, well-researched, meticulously researched biography of who Johnny Mitchell is. But of course, the other side of that is who everybody else is who's been consuming uh, Johnny Mitchell all this time. So we we had a bunch of people come into the studio and just tell us a story about one song. So we're going to start with uh, Tanisha Dugan. People hear her on our show a lot. She's a producing associate at Theater Works. Um, here's Tanisha. Mm-hmm. 
So this is Goodbye a Pork Pie Hat from the album Mingus, which was released in 1979. Uh, uh, Mitchell at this point got moving pretty quickly, and she started to make some new decisions about she, what she wanted to do. Why did you pick this song? So this song, uh, for me, I think, is came to me at a time where I was really kind of deciding or understanding the kind of artist that I was going to be. Uh, I heard it when I was a student at the Academy, the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts. Uh, I was in the jazz band at that point, uh, and I was one of the soloists. Uh, and Diane Mauer. What, what were you playing? I was a singer. Oh, singing, singing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so Diane Mauer was Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and um, Diane Mauer selected this song as a song for me to sing. Mm. Um, and I didn't really know the song um, but of course I knew Mingus and I knew Lester Young uh, and I had a lot of uh, relationship with Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter Mm -hmm. because my dad listened to those records all the time and they're both playing right here correct Um, and so when Diane picked it and said I want you to solo on it I was like okay (laughs) what is this song Um, so I listened to the original Mingus piece which is an ode to Lester Young Mm -hmm. Loved it, um, and then heard her sing it afterwards. And the lyrics, um, exactly, mm, yeah. <laughs> were magical and beautiful. Um, and it it created for me this um, conflict mm. because I wasn't a singing major. You know, mm. I didn't really intend to sing, but I sang this song, um, and Berkeley College of Music. Um, started knocking um, on my door and I thought oh maybe I meant to go a different path mm. and so this song for me is is about um, discovery right. about understanding it's about both you and Joni Mitchell stretching exactly I mean she's going exactly. in a place no, people were uncomfortable with this album yeah uh, it's her totally fan, free jazz yeah her fan base was she was making it with Mingus Mingus was a dying man at the time he actually mm-hmm. died before the total mm-hmm. completion uh, of the album uh, but she didn't cut any corners. You can tell. There's this decision that she's made to immerse herself. She worked with a lot of musicians who aren't even on the album mm-hmm. before she got going on the album. So, yeah, you're saying this is about challenging, getting out of your own comfort zone. Too. Yeah, and she doesn't sound anything like herself Yeah. Um, the, or the Joni Mitchell that we've come to know and love, right? Like, she's not the pop singer um, that we all call on when you hear this album mm-hmm. and when you hear this song. And so the fact that she really sounds like a vocalist to me, um, and that's not to diminish the work that she's done that is so popular, but that mm-hmm. you really get to see the reaches of what she can do with her voice yeah. and how she can storytell within it is impressive and exciting because, like you said, it hadn't we hadn't seen it right. before then. Well, Shorter is trying to make Reed's sound like the human voice. <laughs> and she's trying to make her voice sound like Reed's, too, at times. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, she'd done some Lambert, Lambert Hendricks mm-hmm. and Ross stuff mm-hmm. before getting to this. But this is so much a different iteration. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, so that's great. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a nice, your story and her story. <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, that's the point of music, right? That's the point of how we interface with art. That we find ourselves inside of it um, and learn something more through it. Uh, so I'm grateful to her and all the artists, really, Mangus and Lester Young, that sort of collided to make this piece of work happen. All right. We're going to leave it right there. That's the perfect place to end that. Let's play it out a little bit. And there's black babies 
So, David Yaffe, the point of music and art, we find ourselves inside of it. Uh, I'm just going to oh, yeah. ask you to react. Amazing how there are just stories upon stories upon stories with that track. Yeah. Um, that's the most famous song that Charles Mingus ever wrote. Charles Mingus, a great, <laughs> great composer, one of the great composers of the 20th century, um, and one of the great bass players ever, and one of the great band leaders ever. Uh, and so a lot of his songs were based on stories, and that one was based on a story that he told Joni, um, that he visited Lester Young about six months before he died. So his wife had kicked him out of their house and on Long Island, and so he got a place right at 52nd and Broadway so that he could just be right there where the clubs were. Um, this was, you know, late 50s. And um, and so they're, they're just staring out the window, and... Uh, um, Stan Getz pulls out on this Cadillac and uh, Lester Young says, oh, he he bought that uh, Cadillac on the way I play. You know, he mm-hmm. bought that Cadillac on my sound. Yeah. You know, because and, 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 Stan Getz was very Lester Young influenced. And, um, and so, so he, Charles Mingus has this story about this great dying man. Now he's the great dying man. Mm-hmm. And he's telling the story to Joni. And um, so first Joni was a little bit intimidated. And she said, why don't you, why don't you get John Hendricks to write the lyrics? He's mm-hmm. the greatest bebop lyricist. And he said, oh, I did. You want to hear it? So then he plays it for her. And then she said, oh, my God, it's so maudlin. He's like, I know. The whole thing is the poor black man this and the poor black man that. And so... She starts by just remembering the conversation with Mingus, and that gives her the 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 first uh, couple of verses. But then she needs a third act, and she doesn't know what to do. And she's walking around very frustrated. That she she needs inspiration, right? So she's with Don Elias, who was her boyfriend at the time, great uh, percussionist. They, they were in a relationship and he played congas on Don Juan's Reckless Daughter and then he played Kit on the Shadows and Light tour. And um, and they, uh, they they walk into this bar uptown and the, uh, the, the, the sign uh, outside says Charlie's and then they walk in and it, there's another sign and it says Pork Pie Hat Bar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And she, and then everything just came to her, you know. I, I, I mean, what she wrote down in that final verse: "We came up from the subway from the music midnight maze with Charlie's bass and Lester's saxophone, taxi horns and brakes, and Charlie's down in Mexico with the healers, and the sidewalk leads them to uh, two dancers. We're standing outside this black bar, you know. She's she's telling the story. Yeah, that that, that third verse is just like laying it out. Do you get the picture? Um, and it was just things came to Joni like that all the time, where an experience would just reach out to her and give her what she needed. We're talking to and, David uh, Yaffe. Uh, yeah. His uh, his book is uh, Reckless Daughter, a portrait of Joni Mitchell. Uh, and uh, so uh, I want to do one more clip here before we go to our first break. And I did want to get like one mischief maker. I wanted to get somebody who, uh, I mean, most of the people. I, by the way, like when people walked in here, I when I first approached Tanisha Dugan, I didn't know whether she had a Joni Mitchell cut that she liked at all. I mean, it never occurred to me that she had this story of singing this particular song while she's trying to decide what to do with her life. And that's one of the surprises. You like. I, I, I didn't pick anybody based on how much they know about Joni Mitchell or what I thought they knew about Joni Mitchell. So there's just full of surprises. So I did ask uh, Brendan Sullivan. I guess I probably could have guessed that Brendan wasn't going to necessarily salute the Joni Mitchell flag. Uh, has, he's toured the world as a DJ. He's a producer and author of Rivington Was Ours, Lady Gaga, The Lower East Side, and The Prime uh, of Our Lives. So <laughs> let's hear what, if you really, really love Joni Mitchell, you might want to turn off the radio for five minutes. Cause, uh, but, but you won't. It's not that. It's not going to be that assault. All right, here we go. 
So Joni Mitchell isn't really exactly generationally right for you. You're more in a position <laughs> yes. where you can look at what Joni Mitchell is saying to other people. Yes. Joni Mitchell is in that category that we call mom jams. <laughs> you know, these are there's nothing wrong with any of these songs. They're not particularly cool, I would say that. They're they're <laughs> super enjoyable though. What I imagine with this with this cut specifically. I am on a lonely road and I am traveling, 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 looking for something. What can it be? Oh, I hate you some. In all I want, this is sort of like your your mother's version of "I did it my way," or you know, you know, two woods diverged in a wood, and I took the one that's traveled by. I, I took the one that's traveled by. It's this idea of this this person forging their own path, doing it their own way. It's right there in the beginning. That's what people are, are mostly going to hear when they listen to this. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the driving song. It's a car song. It's it's you've just done errands or dropped the kids somewhere. Whether whether your mother or anybody, you know. But this is that that is the the that is the hoof in this song. That's what's driving this song forward. Is you know, you're doing it your own way. I was trying to figure out where this song came into my life, mm-hmm. and I realized I had DJed a wedding in the Hamptons where this was the mother son dance. Uh-huh. So oh. it is a cute one. Joni Mitchell is slightly older than some of her baby boomer audience would be Mm -hmm. she is the older sister of boomer she was born in 1943 so she's just on the slight curve of it she sort of missed um you know maybe we'll get to woodstock in a second but she was not a anti-vietnam she was she was sort of in the bob hope camp of supporting the troops she she had said at the time of woodstock that she she stayed away from it but that she had uncles who died in World War II. So that was that, that was what her generation was focused on when she thought of, of war and the troops and things like that. So all of her songs haven't aged, they haven't stayed cool throughout the ages, I would say. I do really, what I do like about Joni Mitchell, there is a cool punk rock element to hearing a song and your immediate reaction isn't, wow, it's amazing that people can do this with music. You sort of have a moment where you think, you know, I could do that. You know, you could pick up a guitar and play a Joni Mitchell song. And, and not only that, this is an era of, you know, we're on our way into having guitar gods and electric guitars and strumming. But if, if you're in college and, you know, someone has a guitar and you go, oh, I'd love to, you know, what wouldn't it be fun to play guitar? And you're going to press your fingers down on steel strings. Your fingers are going to hurt the first day. You're going to go out of tune and you don't know how to tune it. There's all these things that are missing in a Joni Mitchell song. These are all, most of these are played or at least composed on nylon strings, which are a little easier on the hands. The, the strings are a little farther apart on the instrument. These are things and that... And with no recognizable tuning, too. Yes, I mean, yes, yeah. by far. Uh, I mean, that that's the problem with trying to play a Joni Mitchell song is she wrote it so that she could play it and she could sing it. I think that they're pretty... They're, they're not as transferable as, say, a Joan Baez song would be. Uh, and so uh, I think another thing about Blue, as you're talking about this and particularly talking about perhaps your mother's generation. <laughs> um, so Blue is the album on which this particular song occurs. And, and it is, you know, if you are driving around doing some errands and picking up kids at soccer and stuff like that, and that's where you've gotten to, I would imagine that to con- the Blue and a song like this one would connect you pretty easily back to the person that you were when you were listening to that album. Oh, that yeah. is so true. This is an album that stays right where you left it. Yeah. I would say few couples have, you know, this is our song. Yeah. But plenty of people in their personal time would go, oh, yeah, I remember when I got this record and I right. remember, you know, being head over heels of this with this guy or girl in college. Mm-hmm. And you can go right back to that place without it being in car commercials and on the radio. Right. All right, so we should we should we should say one other thing here, which is the point that you make about Patti Smith and Joni Mitchell. Oh yes, I think of Joni Mitchell as being a little bit ahead of the herd in terms of the music she was producing, but in a way that she was behind the culture. And then someone like Patti Smith would come along. She's a little bit too old for Woodstock. If you want to specifically talk about Woodstock, yeah, yeah, I do. Joni Mitchell, who sang, who's she probably the biggest song. song, is Woodstock, right? 
And she's and, and there's something how it's, she's sort of cutely behind the times because Woodstock comes out. Woodstock takes place in 1969, the year after the Summer of Love, and then the song Woodstock comes out and it's the first song of the 70s. But Joni Mitchell was so established at that point that her management team said, "Don't play. It's a waste of time to go. You know, who cares about this festival in on a farm in upstate New York?" So she stayed behind to do the Dick Cavett show in New York City. So this entire Woodstock song. You have to imagine that it's the perspective of someone who just watched it happen on the TV news. All right. That is the not necessarily terribly reverent uh, Brendan Sullivan uh, and David. Yeah, I'm sure you have a lot you want to say, but he's not wrong about the fact she didn't go to Woodstock. Yes, but he's wrong about the reason. Yeah. Um, she wanted to go to Woodstock. Um, she hadn't done major television. It's not that she was a behind the times person. She would have had a prominent spot at Woodstock. Um but but um you know david geffen was was with her in the in the airport mm-hmm. and they were looking at the screens and they were seeing hippies in mud, in mud and they were seeing that new york that bethel new york was being declared a national disaster area and at the and at the time the second largest city in new york state and he said look it's hippies in the mud um we can fly you in because Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young were flying in on a on a helicopter with Elliot Roberts, who was also Joni's manager, mm-hmm. and she could have flown in with them, and and played, but um, they Geffen believed that um, it was more important for her to do Dick Cavett because mm-hmm. she hadn't done major American television before, and, um, and 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 uh, her first two albums didn't sell very much. Mm-hmm. So she really needed the exposure, and um, so that and so she goes back to the Sherry Netherland with David Geffen, and then watches it on TV like everyone else, and she's sad because she thinks, "Oh God, this is the greatest event of my generation, and I've missed it." And so she then wrote the song. Writing the song came out of the sadness for missing it. Yeah, she, she, she came close she, to. Yeah, it was going more of a dirge for her, I think. Right? It was yeah. exactly a dirge, yeah. and and and. Um, but then she said that if she had gone, she wouldn't have written the song because she would have been caught up with the backstage egos and it wouldn't have seemed like utopia. It seemed like utopia because it was from a distance. There's an interesting artistic point in, in that. And we're going to take a little break. We'll come back. We have so much to talk about in so little time. And we have David Yaffe here, his book, Reckless Daughter, a portrait of Joni Mitchell's, where you're going to find about 300 more stories, every bit as iconic as that. So to uh, reestablish, yeah, in 2017, uh, this wonderful book by David Yaffe came out, Reckless Daughter, A Portrait of Joni Mitchell. And I said, let's do a Joni Mitchell show. And it just has taken a while to figure out exactly how to do it and who was going to produce it. And it turned out Jay Holt uh, stepped forward. He said, I'm going to do this. And, and we we had this plan. Uh, to, to, we'd have David on, but we'd also have people on just talking uh, about songs so that David could listen to them and kind of react and maybe tell more of what he knows about any individual song. And it's always was very surprising, especially the songs people pick. I'm going to do another one. Just play this for uh, David. This is uh, Lee Newton. Uh, she's director of uh, program promotion for Connecticut Public, uh, where we all work. Uh, she's a freelance TV host and voiceover talent, uh, and that's all I'm going to say. Before <laughs> Lee says a word, besides just chuckling in the background, uh, I, we're going to play the beginning of this song and uh, then get Lee talking about it. Hajira, 
a strange boy. So, Lee, tell us, tell us about this. Well, you know, I mean, there are lots of songs that I could choose as my all-time favorite Joni song, but this is the one that I keep trying to play for people mm-hmm. because I love it. I mean, it there's just something, um, I mean, it has this very sensual, languid quality to it. And it's just, it's, a, it's an amazing song um, because she has such great visual imagery in the lyrics. I mean, she's famous for that anyway, but she's sort of fallen for this man-child and she's frustrated with him because... You know, on one hand, she kind of wants him to be her intellectual and artistic equal, and he's clearly not that, but she's physically drawn to him uh, in so many ways. And it's just, it's a beautiful song about that kind of dichotomy, but it has some incredible lyrics where she, she draws together this image of them in a bed and breakfast in New England, and I love those lyrics so much. Well, she's so we know a little bit about this too. So this is from the album Hegira. Right. It's about 1976, and and she actually is traveling around sometimes in disguise uh, right. with a wig and sunglasses, and she's also sometimes traveling with men. Her relationship with the drummer John Guerin is falling apart. She has an affair with Sam Shepard at one point. And that's probably the basis of the song Coyote. And this is a guy. This is a guy who we are told anyway yes. was a flight attendant who <laughs> was in his 30s and did live with his parents, as is said in the lyric. Right, and um, somehow as she met him and she was having an affair with this young guy, and I I don't know much more about him than that as well, but I know that they were in Maine at one point, and I think that is where she's conjuring up these images of them in what sounds like a really stodgy kind of bed and breakfast. (laughs) And there are these lyrics, if you don't mind me reading them. Go ahead. Well, she talks about, you know, a thousand glass eyes were staring in a cellar full of antique dolls. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found an old piano and sweet chords rose up in wax New England halls. So you get the idea of this, but then it continues with, while the borders were snoring under crisp white sheets of curfew, we were newly lovers then. We were fire in the stiff blue-haired house rules. And I just, I love that because it's sort of, the perfect embodiment of fresh new love, you know, <laughs> and, and there's nothing better when there's constraints to that, you know, when there's, you're in the middle of, of something and it's kind of a secret and it's hidden and I, I just, I love it. A lot of the songs don't have much of a structure, a traditional song structure. There isn't that verse, chorus, verse, chorus. It's all a lot of verses. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jaco Pistorius does not play on this song, although he does play on so many of those songs. And, but it's, it's all just about the mood, the atmosphere, um, this sort of searching, lonely quality to the whole record. And, and I think this song is a good example of that. Lee Newton, beautifully put. We'll end it there. A thousand glass eyes were staring in a cell. So Jay Holt and I are looking at the clock and we're realizing we're not going to be able to play all the things that were like this that we did and still have time to talk to David Yaffe. So we're going to put, put take a Jim Chapdelaine and Steve Metcalf, who had a long and really interesting conversation about two songs. We're going to put that up as a web extra. We'll guide you to it later. We're going to do the same thing with jazz pianist Noah Behrman. Um, and uh, so we'll tell you how to get to that uh, as we go along here. And check our Twitter feed to WNPR Colin on Twitter to help you find that stuff. So, um, so uh, David, um, so much to say here. I, I guess w- one of the places that I want to talk about, I want to start here, is there's so many moments in her career where it seems that as though she, more than most artists that I can think of, decides that in order to grow, she essentially has to burn down her musical past a little bit. There's there's no way you can make Hijira if you're attached to the person you were on For the Roses or something, you know, right. there's there, uh, maybe right. talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, Dylan said he was not busy being born, he's busy dying, and uh, he did the same thing. And um, one thing about it is that her voice changed even between uh, Court and Spark and, and uh, Hijira, it becomes a lot huskier and heavier because of she had a four 
pack habit mm-hmm. of cigarettes. And so that prematurely aged her voice. And But it also meant that she just didn't sound like that person on those earlier records already. And uh, But then she just kept on changing. Her, her, her social life changed. Her crowd changed. I remember Crosby was telling me that like when he went to see her and the and the concert that was recorded for the Shadows and Light live album for 1979, that he hadn't seen her in years mm-hmm. because her, her crowd changed, and he he called it an an art crowd. She was hanging with an art crowd, you know. And so just you know, she she did keep changing, and uh, and I think at her most vital was when you know you're catching her at the, these moments of transformation, and then I just think when I hear it, oh my God, thank God they got this on tape. Right. And I think Thank also... Thank God they got this on tape. Yeah. One and, of the things she's, you know. she's not afraid to do is to not like the way that popular music sounds. So, you know, mm-hmm. at a certain point, she just didn't like the way bass sounded and drums mm-hmm. sounded uh, on mm-hmm. all the other incredibly popular, more or less pure, you know, composed mm-hmm. um, popular music of the time. She just didn't like it. And, and that's sort of... She comes back to that a lot. There's a point in, in your book uh, where this is much uh, further in the future there's a 1990 charity concert celebrating mm-hmm. the fall of the Berlin Wall and mm-hmm. she's surrounded by the great rock stars of her time and and mm-hmm. what she just decided she just doesn't like any of this right right that's right I mean um she, you know I, I mean she, everybody was acting weird or at least she thought that everybody was acting weird she just thought that nobody had any manners right it's you Cindy know? Lauper and Brian Adams and I think Sinead yeah. O'Connor and she's yeah. just like like who are these people I mean Sinead O'Connor actually worshipped her mm. But she did it in a weird way. Yeah. You know, uh, and and she said in an interview, Joni said in an interview, oh, I like Sinead. She's a passionate little singer. Right. <laughs> um, but Joni had a very specific idea about what she wanted records to sound like. And mm-hmm. I mean, and this is really part of genius. When she has the specific idea of something that doesn't exist yet, mm-hmm. and she thinks, I want it to be that. Right. And I reject anything that that fails to be that, or I will tolerate this thing that fails to be that, but really, I'm not going to quit until I get exactly what I want it to sound like. I'm not going to make any compromises, which is very hard to do when you're making a record. And that's why um, she had no producer credit for the first 10 albums, mm-hmm. except for David Crosby. She had David Crosby, and then the nine albums that came after that <laughs> had no producer credit. And because she, when in fact, Henry Louis, her engineer, really was a producer, but she just didn't want him getting the title producer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um but I think also, you know, and yeah, maybe it is her and Dylan. Um, almost everybody who's any good and who has any success is somewhat attached to the thing that they did that was successful and, and mm-hmm. made them made them popular. And, you know, mm-hmm. there's sort of no way in the world that James Taylor doesn't like, you know, S- Sweet Baby James or, mm-hmm. or Fire and Rain or something. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, and these these are unusual people. I mean, you can't make mm-hmm. Hajira, and God knows you can't make Mingus unless you mm-hmm. are prepared, basically, to sever ties with all of the things that have contributed so far to your success. Oh, yeah, and because you're not the same person you were five minutes ago. <laughs> or the person that you'll be in five minutes. Yeah. That's why it's incredible. They, ca- they caught it on tape. Incredible. Yeah. They caught this moving target on tape. Amazing. And, and was, she was astounding over and over again. All right, we're gonna, we've got time for one more segment here, and what we're going to do, we're going to play a song out of this segment, and then when David and I come back, David's going to talk about it. So I want you to listen a little bit more carefully than you usually do to bumper music. The able-bodied have shipped away Lay down on the hearts Molly Maggie gets her tea leaves red You'll be married in a month, they say Lay down on the hearts These leaves are crazy
Today's show was produced by Jay Holt and me, Kion Wolf, with big help from Betsy Kaplan. Our intern is Seth Blair, and the part of Bill Curry was played by Leonard Cohen, David Crosby, Graham Nash, James Taylor, Jackson Brown, and Sam Shepard. On tomorrow's show, the nose becomes the trunk and watches the Dumbo remake. And now, back to Colin. All right, so we're back. Uh, we're back with David Yaffe. Uh, he is visiting us today to talk about Joni Mitchell, and we are talking about Joni Mitchell uh, with uh, a bunch of our friends, too. We are going to offer two other uh, uh, sort of reflections uh, as web extras, uh, one involving uh, Jim Chapterlain and Steve Metcalf, the other one involving the jazz pianist uh, Noah Behrman. Uh, but uh, we're going to stay with David right now. And so uh, I asked everybody to listen carefully as we were uh, playing Out of the Bee. Uh, that's uh, from... Uh, the album from Journey's album Chalk Mark uh, in a Rainstorm. It's called Tea Leaf Prophecy. So uh, tell us about this. Well, that song was originally recorded uh, for that album, uh, Chalk Mark in a Rainstorm, 1988. But uh, Joni re recorded it, and, it and it turned out that it was the last thing she ever recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, her ex husband, Larry Klein, was producing this album for Herbie Hancock called River the Joni Letters, which was an album of Joni Mitchell songs um, recorded by Herbie. And Joni and her beer close, and um, and so that she uh, it was it was it was Klein's idea to choose the song because Joni's mother had just died, and the song was about her mother. Mm. And so on the 1988 version, she says Molly McGee, but when she re-records it with Herbie Hancock in 2007, she says Myrtle McKee, which is her mother's maiden name. Mm. And um, it's just incredible that this whole song about destiny. And the unlikeliness of all of these magical things happening and these implausible things happening would be the last thing that she would ever record. And um, and so uh, and and it's also very funny in some places. It's a dark song, but there's one line in it that always makes me laugh, which is that she finds, you know, she goes to get her tea leaves red, and then the tea leaves say you'll be married in a month, and then she says these leaves are crazy. <laughs> I mean, I think that's a great line. She's she's a very funny person, and and yeah. you know, I, I think maybe that's not always entirely clear. Although, if we'd played the opening song and talked to me a little bit deeper, I mean, at one point oh, yeah. she actually imitates a chicken. You know, she does chicken uh, squawking. Yeah, and, right. it's a pretty good chicken too. She uh, does a pretty good chicken. But it's incredible because you've got like this drudgery of domestic life. You know, mm-hmm. she plants her garden in the spring. She does the winter shoveling. Tokyo Rose on the radio. She says she says she's leaving, but she don't go. <laughs> And and so Joni was the one that was able to break out of all that, you know, and break out of Saskatoon right. and do something that nobody could have dreamed of and uh, and be something that nobody could have dreamed of, including Joni herself. Yeah, I mean, I think that and, that's sort of, it goes back to what we were saying about all these different phases uh, of her music, which involve burning down the past or just completely mm-hmm. violating whatever set of, uh, of boundaries exist uh, mm-hmm. or that, 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 that circumscribe her and define her. And she kind of did that with her life, too. I mean, she, a lot of other people, you know, with the kind of experience she had with polio, with having uh, being brought up in a certain kind of family without really having mm-hmm. necessarily exposure to all kinds of culture. I mean, every single mm-hmm. time she just said, screw that, that you are not going to hold me in this path. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, um, and so she... You know, this other thing, sleep little darling, this is your happy home. Hiroshima cannot be pardoned. Don't have kids when you get grown. Because this world is shattered. The the wise are mourning, the fools are joking. Oh, what does it matter? The wash needs ironing and the fire needs stoking. You know, um, don't get, have kids when you get grown was something that Myrtle would say to Joni mm. a lot. You know, as m- meaning that she was a pain in the ass. Right. Right. But then she adds this world is shattered. And that's not Joni's mother. That's Joni. This world is shattered is Joni. Um, but then you get back to the chores. You get yes. back to the drudgery of domestic life. And and by the way, Joni saw that there was an honor to it, even though she didn't choose. You know, she, she got to be beyond it. But she, you know. I mean, she has a song on Hegira called Song for Sharon. That's all that's about wondering what would have happened if she'd gone the path of a normal person. Mm hmm. Um, you know, which, yeah. I, I just, you know, before we run out of time, too, one thing I, I just want to talk quickly about, because I'm also very interested in how people kind of use music and interact with music and stuff like that. I feel like there's a lot of people who stopped somewhere, you know? Mm. I mean, there are a lot of people who stopped. 
maybe they stopped after Hegira. Maybe I, 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 it's hard mm-hmm. to tell. But I mean, mm-hmm. it might be just worth it for you to just say a word or two about some of the joys that you can discover mm-hmm. in the later part of the Joni canon. Absolutely. Um, there is a kind of a snobbery about like a rock critic's eye view of Joni, and I think that I was guilty of that myself when I was younger before I wrote this book, mm-hmm. um, where I thought, wow, the first 10 albums are incredible, and then after that, it's so disappointing. And I don't feel that way anymore, even though it, there's nothing like Jocko. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, there are certain things that you just can't recreate. But the things that she did do as an older writer were just astonishing, and they were astonishing in a different way. And then when you hear her voice become more ravaged, she uses that to such great dramatic effect. And sometimes you're feeling ravaged, and you <laughs> want sucker from something that will s- s- give that to you. Um, you don't necessarily want to hear the ingenue, right? You know, you 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 want to hear Billy Holiday on Lady in Satin. You know, that does something for you, or you know, Edith Piaf, or on and on, right? Mm-hmm. And um, or or later Dylan, for that matter, does that for you. I, I and, also uh, think like like Night Ride Home, yes, is an amazing album that com- it is. P- competes very easily w- with the early canon. I mean, just the songwriting all the way through it is incredible, and I, people I don't that, know like, that album. If, if we if we if we call late Joni like from Wild Things Run Fast onward, mm-hmm. you know, I think probably Night Ride Home has the most great songs on it. Yeah, because you've got you've you've got coming from the cold, and you've got two gray rooms, and. Um, you got nothing can be done. I mean, you know, right now, like I'm, I'm the age that Joni was when she, when she cut that. And so when she, she says, um, I, I am not old, I'm told, but I am not young and nothing can be done. My heart is like a smoking gun and nothing can be done. Mm -hmm. That, that's, that's your mid forties right there. And so. It, it, so, uh, by the way, whoever that fellow was who talked about mom mm-hmm. rock, <laughs> I mean, well, some people are moms and they still have souls and they, they still love music. <laughs> Sorry. Um, also on that album, mom, I mean, if you just want to have some yeah. fun, I mean, Ray's dad's Cadillac is, you know. Yeah, sure. I mean, th- things like that. are, And I mean, that's a, that's a quality that you don't that you're not used to from a Joni Mitchell song. And it's a great memory song, you know. And then the next album, Turbulent Indigo. Uh, you get one of my very favorite Joni Mitchell songs, the title track mm-hmm. about Van Gogh. It's an incredible song. Um, you know, Sex Kills is is amazing. And then on the next album, Tame the Tiger, you get Man from Mars, which is amazing. So, I mean, you've, you've got these great songs. Harlem and Havana is a pretty cool song, too, actually. Uh, yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, great, great Wayne Shorter. Wayne Shorter, by the way, is on 10 Joni Mitchell albums. That's amazing, Start, too. Yeah. Starting, in, starting, in, starting with Don Juan's Reckless Daughter. He's on 10 albums. Well, David Yaffe, um, first of all, we want everybody to see, really, seriously, at the end of the show, seek those things out. Get on your Spotify or whatever it is that you do, and, but don't use it the way you usually use Spotify. <laughs> you really have to kind of immerse yourself and dig a little deeper. But a, a lot of these later albums are really worth it. Uh, we've been talking to David Yaffe, assistant professor of humanities at Syracuse University, author, most recently, Reckless Daughter, a portrait of Joni Mitchell. We just thought we would sort of end. There's some really, 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 really great covers uh, of Joni Mitchell. But I'm not sure there's anything quite as amazing as this. And I don't even have to tell you who this is. So sweet, I could drink a case of you. Darling, oh, I still be on my feet. I still.